Hey, welcome to the Art Condition Podcast, a weekly show that will discuss the business, community, and often undiscussed stress and mental health concerns of being a professional artist or even a serious hobbyist. I'm Joby. I've been in the tattoo and illustration professions for 25 years. My co-host is Moose, a data analyst, social media manager, and art agent. If you enjoy the content, please consider visiting the Patreon page and the show notes to help support the effort. Or if that's not an option, please like, subscribe, leave a good review, or just share with your friends. And definitely go visit the links of our guests on this episode. Thanks for listening and have a great day. Hey, thanks for joining us. Today we are talking to Stephen Sitton. Stephen goes by Stumpy Fongo on all his social media outlets. We talked to him today about the transition he recently made from a stable career working for a highly reputable studio into the wild world of freelance. We talk about what motivated the change and what a person should be prepared for if they are making a similar change. We also get into some of the finer points of running a business for yourself. How do you need to balance your time and your checkbook? What elements of professional conduct are most important and the high value of having a business mentor? We talk a bit about the plans that he has to make it all sustainable in the long term. And lastly, we get into his role as a full-time streamer on Twitch and how valuable the community there has been. Without any more delay, here's the interview. Welcome, Stephen. Thank you so much for being here and joining us. Let's start off by talking about you. That's why we're here. Can you give us a little rundown on your background, your history, how you got into art, and where you're at today? Yeah, absolutely. So I've been drawn for my entire life. I mean, I wish that I could pull it up, and I know that's not what you guys want to see, but my mom, and my mom's a huge oil painter. The house is covered with her art. So I mean, I've been surrounded with art since I was little. Um, it didn't become apparent that that's what I wanted to do until probably like the latter into high school. But yeah, I, I didn't question what I was going to do going into college. Um, full support from my parents. You know, a lot of people's parents are not as jazzed if their kids want to go the creative path because. Uh, you know, there's always that risk or there, there's been that kind of taboo about it in especially in past generations so full support from my parents going into college um so you know i went i went to brigham young university which is not an art school but it's it's a just a general it's a private um religious uh school and i got a bachelor of fine arts degree in with an emphasis in illustration and uh, so that the program there it's it's very old school there's a lot of very talented um kind of uh, old school children's book illustrators that um, that make up the faculty there, and so a, a lot of my portfolio and everything that I was gearing towards was towards the publishing side of things. So I was I was fully expecting to be like a children's book illustrator or like the type of illustrator that does like the book jackets for you know young adult novels and that kind of thing. Like that's that's what I was looking for. That's what I was being prepared for. And uh, as as a requirement for my bachelor's degree, they. I required that I do an internship, and the the school did monthly art seminars. So they they would bring in alumni or just guest artists, and they would uh, come in and present what they did out in the industry. And it, it was like a networking opportunity. And I saw I saw a chance with a cool studio um, that maybe I could do an internship. So that that's really all it was at the beginning. Is uh, I was just looking for an internship opportunity. Um, so the the place that I internship was with was called Picture Plane Imaging. They they do a lot of uh, creative imagery for all kinds of different uh, job opportunities, primarily in video games um, and toys, but they've done all kinds of stuff. So uh, through networking, I, I got an opportunity to do an internship um, down in Texas. That's where the studio was. Uh, they have two branches, a LA studio and, and a Texas studio. And yeah, um, so when I, when I actually went there, they had had internships previously, but um, prior to my going there, they didn't actually let interns work on live jobs. And then when I got there, they're like, what do you want to do here? I was like, I don't know. I want to do what you guys do. So um, they started letting me work on live jobs and they, I mean, I fit in pretty quickly. You know, I, I had to kind of hit the ground running. There's a lot of stuff that I didn't know, but I just, um, there's, there's a lot to pretending like, you know what you're doing, even if you don't. And uh, so, yeah, they offered me, you know, after a few months or however long the internship was, they're like, Hey, you want to just stick around? I mean, you don't really even need to finish school if you don't want to. And I was like, well, I kind of want to finish school. So I went back to school, kept working for them on the side, um, finished up school, immediately came back down to Texas and uh, worked there for about eight years um, as an illustrator. And uh, there, there's a lot more to be said about my experience there. I'm sure that that'll be 
questions that you'll have. But um, yeah, so I I came to a point in my life where I had to make some decisions, um, decided, and again, we can talk about that at length, decided I wanted to try my hand at freelancing and working from home and just seeing how it went. And uh, streaming was a big part of that, big part of the motivating factor. But yeah, here we are. How long had you been streaming before you factored that into your decision? Um, So I I started streaming um, in the beginning of the year, in January, and I finally, um, I actually quit my job at the end of um, July or the beginning of August. So probably about like eight months, seven, eight months. Um, I mean, the decision to, to make, to, you know, to do something different was a long time coming and we can talk about that. But um, just seeing how much fun it was, how much passion there was in the community, um, it just rekindled a lot of what um, the reason I got into art in the first place, which I think that um, I had lost along the way quite a bit. Mm. So that was that was a big part of it. Um, and uh, yeah, just uh, the, the biggest part of it for me was the what if factor. You know, I didn't want to get to retirement age and look back and say, you know what, I wonder if I had ever decided to do something different. You know, I wonder how it would have gone. I, I just didn't want to have that on my mind. So there, it was definitely a huge risk. Um, still learning, you know, there's still a lot of things, still a lot of room to grow, but yeah, that was. So I have a question about, uh, you were uh, streaming while you're still employed, correct? Yes. So, uh, were, was it just a matter of energy levels? Like, did you not have enough energy to continue doing other stuff after you got home from, uh, doing that, uh, employment yeah. stuff? Yeah. That, and that was energy levels was part of it. Um, I mean, it's, it's just a lot to work essentially two full-time jobs. I, mean, I know a lot of people do and a lot of people, you know, work three jobs and there's people out there that have way more energy and motivation than I could ever have. But um, it was it was a combination of energy, a combination of um, I started to generate um, commissions more than I had time for. And uh, it, I mean, it got to the point that I was like <laughs> I was like trying to work on stuff like during my lunch break at my studio job and like trying and uh just trying as much as I could to like squeeze in every ounce. And um, I, I, I tried as best as I could to give my studio job like my 100%. But to be honest, my heart was like, I, all I wanted to do was like what the stuff that I was, you know, working on for my freelance stuff or for the Twitch stuff, like that, that's all that I wanted to do. I was just so excited and enthused about it that it was, uh, yeah, it, it, it got to a point that I just couldn't keep up with both and a lot of serious talks with my wife and yeah. That I, that somewhat answers the the immediate follow in that I was hoping for is for you to talk about, you know, kind of what was going on in your thought process when you're at this, you know, relatively reliable, you know, full time employment. Um, that's a nice thing to have as an artist, <laughs> and the wherewithal to decide, okay, this is what I want to do. It's a huge transition. Um, there's no underestimating, you know, how massive a a shift that that can be. Um, I wouldn't ask you to go into any, you know, super detailed, you know, nitty gritty, but was there for the most part, were you happy at the studio, you know, or was there things that were like incentivizing you to want to leave studio work or was it more just the appeal of, what you could be doing outside of that? Uh, definitely all of the above, okay. to be honest. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm not in a huge hurry to burn any bridges with previous employers. Absolutely but, um, not. And there, was definitely, yeah. <laughs> there was definitely some reasons for wanting to try something new. Um, yeah, so, I mean, it was a long time coming. It wasn't just, um, I mean, and I, and I kind of prepared to talk about that, but I don't want to have to sit here and make you wait while I scroll through my notes. No worries. But, um, <laughs> Yeah, it was. There, there's a lot of things that that invo- uh, that come to it, and uh, I'll just try to rattle off the top of my head some of the things that that were kind of big deciding factors. Um, a big part of it for me was uh, was kind of uh, at, at the job that I was in. I was very much um, kind of pigeonholed into a specific um, area in, in kind of in the pipeline. So I didn't, you know, for example, I didn't have much to do with like the initial sketching or concepting phase of projects. Um, There was very little, you know, so I I was quote unquote a finisher at the studio. So it sounds like a Mortal Kombat move, but it's really just um, (laughs) that I, (laughs) 
that I'm the I'm the last guy uh, kind of in the chain um, before things get sent to the client. You know, obviously there's art direction and oversight, but it, the responsibility was on me to make sure that everything came together and everything looked pretty. Um, so, you know, I mean, there had been years that I just hadn't drawn at all, like, ske- you know, sketched in a sketchbook or had any sort of, um, say, in, in the creative, like, groundwork side of things. You know, most of the time when I got projects, everything was already figured out. They'd already, you know, gone down plenty of roads and back and forth with, with the client. And the client was, you know, happy with certain directions. So sometimes I'd get something and be like, yo, I mean, I think that we could take this in a whole other direction and make it look better. And uh, there, there's way too many times where it was just like, this is, this is how it is. You know, we, we've already gone down the road and um, just execute it. Um, so, I mean, and that over years got, you know, a little bit demoralizing just for me as a creative, because, I mean, we, we get into this field because we want to create and we want to make something and make it our own mm-hmm. and have some sort of a say in it. And there was plenty of times when I felt like, uh, like a wrist that was just attached and, you know, not, not necessarily free thinking, um, so that that was one part of it. There was, you know, there was some kind of I- issues with, um, you know, some frustrations, I guess you could say, with with some of the the uh, politics and bureaucracy of the company. But I think that that's probably going to be the same for any studio they work for. Um, but yeah, so just a, just a general disquiet. Um, you know, I I kind of lost. Like I said, I lost I lost my way as far as like why I got into art in the first place. And as a result, you know, when I got when I clocked out at work at the end of the day, I didn't want to think about art, had zero interest in anything artistic. And my passion at that point became video games. You know, I would go home at the end of the day and just and that's and and it it dawned on me. um, It dawned on me at one point, and this may be leading into other questions you have. um, Feel free to interrupt me if I if I blather on too long. But um, (laughs) It, it dawned on me at one point because of the uh, the nature of the uh, the non disclosure agreements that I signed, you know, with the company. They were they were very very gun shy about us posting anything at all, like saying that you know oh that I worked on this or um, my boss was very much just don't post it anywhere, just don't talk about it because you know there's there's too many issues where there is you know there'd be a forum or somebody talking about on Twitter where uh, somebody would comments you know one of our employees would comment on something and you know activision or somebody be like oh you're talking about this and you know they'd come back and be like you know make sure make sure you know so just be very careful about the way that we present ourselves um publicly and there's a lot more to it than that but long story short i didn't have a professional portfolio that that i could take and show to like a separate studio to say hey look i've done this for the last eight years and probably about no probably about a year ago um no, probably about two years ago, it dawned on me really hard that like if if for some reason the studio went under or I lost my job for whatever reason, like I have nothing, I would basically just have to be like, well, you know, I could I could maybe tell people I worked for the studio, but I just became very aware that I needed um, I needed to find my way again as an artist and, and kind of build up a portfolio again. But I'll let you kind of take over now. Oh, well, thank you. No, <laughs> it's fine, man. You, uh, yeah. Ramble. No, I'm sorry. I'm just, I'm, I'm yeah. R- ramble and rattle as much as you want, man. That's what okay. makes half yeah, of this fun. Yeah, we bring you on here to ramble. That's the okay. thing, right? <laughs> yeah, you're, yeah, you're the one that's got to fill the time, dude, not us. Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, that that did remind me of a question, though, that I that I thought of um, that that wasn't in my collection of notes that I had um, pre written, but just that that thing with not you know not being able to access the previous work that you had done before. Um, there's no, is there any way to sort of like compensate for that? You know, because looking at your bio, you've got a list of clients that you've done work for, that the studio has done work for that you were, you know, part of the team on. That's rather, rather impressive. Right. I I won't, I won't name all the names. People can go and see your information, but, um, is there, you were saying that you could kind of, you know, say you worked for the studio are, is there ever like you know like references that you can that you can have you know like a, a, a kind of like yeah. a conf- like a confirmation affidavit from like your right. former boss or whatever that's like yes he worked for this project that was whatever you know right yeah so I mean the way that I phrased that was probably a bit of an over exaggeration but that was just kind of the way that it felt to me um, so yeah so if I were to create like a public website or an online portfolio I couldn't post any actual images. Um, there that said like i did that you know if so if i wanted my, my boss is very old school so like if i wanted to print out like a physical portfolio and like go and meet somebody in person without you know post 
seemed, they were just very afraid of like the public perception of uh, you know of what like an individual person and it's and, and the thing is it's 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 somewhat deceptive too because I'm always a member of a huge team um, very I can't necessarily take credit for you know one particular image um, so I don't know I, it's it's all very convoluted and, and you would think that after having been there as long as I have that I would have, have a clear picture of like what that would look like but um, any time that somebody posted something that they worked on, like on Facebook, just say, you know, just because they're proud of it, you know, they would they would get shot down and asked to take it down. So, um, yeah, I guess I could, you know, I could have that on my LinkedIn or as a, on my resume and just say that I worked there and it would just be on them to try to see what that meant, you know, as far as like visual representation goes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the worst case, I guess you would just say like, I worked on this <laughs> and then yeah, they'd be yeah. like, well, where's the proof of it? And like, well, I talked right. to the NDA guys and here's the phone number of my yeah. former boss. So, um, so if, if I got into an interview, you know, or a meeting with somebody and, and they wanted to talk about it at that point, I could, you know, we could, I could probably have some sort of a PDF prepared. Um, but as far as like posting that anywhere online publicly, like that's, that's where they draw the line. Yeah. And now the position you're in where you're, you know, you're just doing freelance. It's not like you're doing interviews with other studios. So right. it's, you know, it, but you can just sort of be, you can claim, you know, that you did work for those studios just as right. part of your, uh, you know, your general resume or whatever. And, um, yeah. and that works too. How yeah, did you think? Go ahead. Oh, uh, well, um, I'll, yeah. So at one point I was, I was interested in looking at something else. So when I was back in college, I, I had had pretty close contact with an art rep who um, represented a lot of publishing artists. And uh, I had talked with him over the years and off and on, never really committed to anything. But at one point, I was like, you know, I'd like to try something new. And I actually sent him like a PDF similar to what I was talking about of a lot of the jobs that I had done, you know, like Mass Effect and Titanfall and Dragon Age Inquisition with all that kind of imagery in there. And he lost his mind. It's like, well, let's start now. And then, you know, when when um, when talks when we talks became more serious, it, it became pretty apparent, like this isn't necessarily the type of work that I could generate at a reasonable rate, like on my own as a single person. And that was part of the reason why, you know, the company, the studio was so marketable is because they were like a super, they were like a super artist of, you know, like 20 plus different artists. They could pump out stuff quick at a higher, you know, higher quality and, and faster. So um, I honestly couldn't deliver that kind of work individually, um, you know, without it just being crazy expensive. And, and, and so, I mean, we talked more about it, but that conversation was kind of just to be continued. but. Yeah, I uh, most of it was just trying to rediscover who I was in, as an artist and try to figure out my artistic identity. So it sounds a little bit like it, uh, it was an assembly line process that they had, yeah, and absolutely. you were among the, the final stages of that. Correct. So yeah, so within any, within any given project, I mean, every project differed because of the art, art style and the, the chosen you know direction, but. Um, you know, at any given stage, there was a lot of 3D and a lot of photography and a lot of other disciplines involved. Not to say that I couldn't do those things. I mean, I, I, I do have backgrounds in 3D as well, but I mean, that's how I've invested the last, you know, the last of my eight years. So, you know, that's kind of fallen on the wayside. But it's just it's just a lot for a single person to do. I, I don't think that unless you just are some sort of a master at, you know, all the different elements and have a very, very tight, you know, production uh, experience going on. I, I, I don't think that a single person could do the kind of uh, quantity and caliber of work that a studio yeah, you know, that we did as I just don't think it's possible. Well, if if you can, and th this would be a great place to uh, expound and ramble as much as you want, okay. um, because I I, <laughs> I right. think this I think this particular question is is useful for anybody that's in the same or similar position, or at the start of their career, less experienced. I, all of the things um that a person would be in you know kind of looking at where you've gone um walk me through the the lead up to it like um how did you start preparing in order to like make that that final that transition final and at what point did you know you were ready like okay now i can do it yeah um yeah, so I mean, it is kind of touching back to some of the stuff that we had said, but a big, probably, uh, probably the two biggest factors in my decision making um, were one, um, 
you know, my family. So, I mean, the, working in the industry, working, especially because, you know, especially working with uh, game studios, you know, when they are in crunch time, we are in crunch time because, um, or, or they have specific deadlines they need to hit. And there's very often, uh, I mean, way, way too often, more times to, than I can count where, you know, a client will, will delay and delay and delay on proving something. And then, then when they finally prove it, you know, the deadline for delivering it can't move. So that you have like two days to finish something. And that happened like so many times that it just became, it became the norm. Um, so, so many nights of, you know, staying up at my job until 10, 11 at night, um, weeks where maybe I wouldn't see my kids for a few days. And uh, it just became, it, there, it, just, it was just so normal at the company that, you know, anytime I raised my hand to try to say, hey, you know, this, like, this isn't necessarily how I want to live my life or how I want to father my kids. And, you know, my, um, they just, it, it just became so expected that they, I don't know, that, that that's just kind of what was done. That's just kind of how things were done. Um, and so that was a big factor. I, I anticipated having a lot more free time when I went to, uh, <laughs> to full-time freelance, um, which ne- isn't necessarily the case, but I am now in control of that. And, and there, there are, you know, there's things, um, there's goals that I have to try to automate some of this stuff. So there's a little bit more free time, but so a big, a big part of that decision making for me, at least personally, and maybe this won't be relevant to a lot of people, but it was, um, I want to be more available to my family, more available to my kids. Um, and, and that's a big part of, I mean, the, some people do art because they just, they can't imagine them doing anything, anything else. I do art because I really enjoy it, but as much of a priority for me is, is being a good dad, being a good husband. So that was, that was, at, I was constantly at odds with the studio with regards to that. Um, and probably I, I would, I would be willing to argue that a lot of um, potential um, lost promotional opportunities were because I was constantly standing up for uh, my desire to, to, uh, you know, provide in, in that way for my family. So that was one. Um, the second part we've already discussed, but I just, I didn't feel like I, the reason that I went into art, I just, it wasn't scratching that itch for me anymore. For a long time, I felt like I was, uh, I was doing what I went to school for. You know, I, I had, I had gone to school to get a job. I got the job, you know, problem solved. Um, and then, and it, it just became more and more discontent, kind of lost my way as far as why I was an artist in the first place, there had been one point in my life where I seriously considered, um, I'm really into exercise and physical fitness. I, I looked into what it would look like to be a personal trainer. You know, I, I, I just, I, I wasn't, it wasn't doing it for me, you know, anymore. Um, yeah. So that, those are the two biggest reasons as far as uh, knowing that I was ready or preparing. I mean, those, those things made it easier, um, when the time came to prepare, to, to make that choice, no, knowing that I was going to be in control um, of you know, my time t- to some extent and the excitement that I had felt already having streamed and, and jumped back into that for about seven, eight months. Um, and, and, and ultimately, it was a lot of talks with the wife. But um, yeah, so I, I had been in a lot of conversations with a coworker. I mean, there's a guy that I go to the gym with. Um, whenever I go and he, he, he still works at the company I worked for and he, he's very business oriented, has, has a lot more of a business sense than I do, but a lot of conversations with him have kind of painted a picture for me, uh, that it's, it's very possible, very possible as an artist, um, to make money on the internet. But as creatives, it's, we, we tend to not think about things in a business sense. Mm Because that's just not the way our minds are wired. You know, it's very difficult for those two mentalities to like exist within the same brain. But um, yeah, so a lot of talks with him. I became very convinced that um, that it was very possible. And in plenty case in point examples, you know, people that he had uh, kind of mentored and and uh, coached. But and the fact that he was doing it himself on the side, you know, making making some good money with some side projects. So he he was a big uh, influence on me, helping me to feel like you know what we can actually do this. Um, and kind of giving me an idea of what that might look like. I haven't actually implemented a large chunk of the things he said. A lot of that's still in the works of, you know, we're growing and figuring things out. A lot of things I didn't anticipate. Um, so there's still a lot of room to grow. But I still, even to this day, um, on being on the other side of it for a few months, I still remain very confident that it's possible. You just, you have to kind of go about it, right? So all those things in combination um, and just some serious sit-down talks with my wife. Um, she was very supportive that, 
you know, whatever I wanted to do, she would back me up 100%. And, and I'm lucky. I'm very lucky in that regards. Um, another another factor, and, th- and this is, you know, maybe getting to some of the stuff you wanted to hit on later, but, um, you know, everybody's situation is very different. Some people come from different lifestyles where, the, you know, they feel their their quality of life has a different meaning for them. You know, so what, what, what I'm comfortable with as far as, like, what I need for my basic, you know, um, food, clothing, home, all that kind of stuff, insurance, um, quality of life. I mean, that may be different for somebody else. Um, so my wife came from a family that was, you know, very simple. Um, they worked on a farm growing up and she, uh, luckily I married someone who doesn't need a whole lot. Um, she's very content with, with, uh, with what we have. And I mean, the biggest thing that we need is just, we need, you know, food and a place to stay and clothes and we need each other and, you know, the basics. So I'm very lucky in that regard. So, um, we, I mean, do I make as much money as I did at the at the studio gig? Not even, you know, not even close. Not, I'm probably not even close to half. But um, we have what we need, or we are projected to be able to get to a point where we are we're going to be okay, and, um, and 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 that's okay with us. But I'll I'll let you interject some questions here. Well, that, yeah, because we'll we'll definitely get uh, to that a little bit more. Um, I want to dig in a little bit deeper on sure. the sort of the lead up. Um, yeah. And, you know, because you, you, you talked a lot about the sort of the, the headspace that you were in, uh, some sure. of the things that were inspiring you to, to move in this new direction. Can you talk a little bit more about the sort of like the, the practicalities, you know, like the, the technical details? You mentioned that you got a lot of help uh, from this friend who, you know, had a lot of business know-how. Um, obviously, there's like a lot of things. I, I don't want you to go through every little thing. But if there are some like high points that you can think of as far as business advice that you got from this, this friend of yours, um, in things that you should be looking forward to, can you highlight a couple of what those were? Yeah. Uh, I think one, one part of it was, um, especially within the art community and I, and I'm still in that myself, you know, still got a lot of things that I need to change, but a somewhat um a a departure from the mentality like from the commission mentality so there's so many people that you know will commission something and it's kind of a one-off image and i mean even my wife who's not an artist or my family like when they ask me like what do people even do with these images i I don't know they post it online somewhere or they use it as a profile picture in their game you know like it's not very apparent to to people outside of the industry like what what the artwork is even (coughs) being used for um so trying to trying to make um Again, this I would have to go into a lot more detail, and I'd have to probably review a lot of my notes. But uh, the mentality of like establishing the value of the thing that you're selling. Um, what is the value? Because if you're just selling like some pixels that somebody can use to show their friends and post online, I mean that has very little meaning or value to it. Um, you know, establishing w- w- taking that thing and maybe it turns into a T-shirt or your you know, and the the concept of constantly upselling. Um, you know, you do a project for somebody and then you know, how how can you, I guess the mentality is how, how can you take the thing that you've done and how can you make that thing generate money without having to continue to like invest too much time and effort into it? So is that, does that mean you're selling prints? Does that mean you're selling stickers? Are you selling a sketchbook? Are you selling uh, t-shirts? You know, and on and on and on. And there's so many ways to do that. It's just, it, you have to, you have to do it. You have to approach it in a way that people, people are aware, like, okay, this is, this is what, you know, Steven Sitton or Stumpy, this is what uh, his brand is. You know, when I buy something from him, I'm going to get all this other stuff or I don't know. So, yeah, I mean, this this could be an entire podcast conversation. And, and I mean, if you would be interested, I could probably even get in my friend to talk about this stuff because he he he's a wizard um, and he will he will convince even the most skeptic uh, of uh, naysayers that it's entirely possible. But th- those are some big things. Um, just just trying to make sure that you're establishing you know, that value of the product that you're selling. Cause there's so many ways um, to sell the same thing more than once. Yeah. That sounds like a great uh, follow-up episode uh, sometime in the future. Yes. Yeah. 100% for sure. Um, so you also mentioned some things that you hadn't anticipated. Uh, that was a question that I anticipated <laughs> and <laughs> am very curious about, you know, what are some of the things that you've had to adapt to uh, that you didn't see coming? Yeah, so I think the biggest thing was I was expecting to just have all this free time to, you know, to do, I don't know, just be, be able to play with my kids more or help around the house more. I mean, there, there's the constant back and forth of, you know, who is responsible for what, you know, the, the dynamic of being married with, you know, with, with kids. And um, 
I still think that my wife takes on more than she should have to, you know, so I, I, you know, they're, they're being, being busier or just almost as busy as I was, was something I didn't anticipate, but that I, I feel like is something that's more in the short term. You know, if I, ideally I want to come up with, with systems, you know, and get the foundations and the systems in place so that, you know, when I do something, it, it doesn't, you know, there's, there's all this stuff that kind of just happens, maybe not necessarily autonomously, but, you know, without me having to, so that would, that would involve, you know, have things like having a website built or having, you know, commission forms are in place or, or things, you know, places that people can go and, and all those kind of basic things in place, you know, places where people can buy my merchandise, where it's, where it's easy and seamless to get to, um, I mean, little things like that, that just kind of take, um, take the burden off of me to have to like figure everything out. So I'm still in the figuring thing out place and building up systems. But yeah, so I wasn't expecting to be as busy as I am. I've had plenty of heart to heart talks with my wife about, yo, you're not, <laughs> not necessarily any less busy than you were. But um, the fact remains that at any given time, like right now, you know, I can just up and leave anytime mm-hmm. I want to. Yeah. And that, that is hugely valuable um, for my family. If I, you know, if for whatever reason, I just need to take a day off to, for whatever, I, I mean, I can. Um, and that's, that's something that I haven't been able to do or to be able to say um, in a long time, you know, previously, if I, if I, for whatever reason needed to take off, there's always that anxiety of um, what, what's going to be waiting for me when I get back. Um, how is this going to be perceived, you know, all that kind of stuff. But so that's been nice. Um, let's see. Yeah. Another thing that I didn't anticipate necessarily was um, because of how passionate that I feel about creating art, all of a sudden, like, that's all I want to do now. And um <laughs> It, yeah. it, I actually have to like it, to to like manually turn that off so that I, you know, it's like my wife's had to get after me so many times, like, like, you know, so before it was like I would I couldn't wait to like clock in, clock out for the day so that I could go home and like see my kids and all that kind of stuff. And now it's like I have to like peel myself away from the computer because I just I'm loving it. So that's that's that, I wasn't expecting that. But um, I mean, that's a good problem to have to be so enthused about what you're doing that you don't want to stop but um another thing that i wasn't expecting was that um streaming is actually incredibly exhausting um Uh there's (laughs) when i first started streaming i i expected to treat it like a full-time job so i was going to do like the seven eight hours a day and that lasted about like a week um (laughs) that lasted that lasted about a week and uh because yeah it's just like streaming is so much more than just creating art and letting people watch um you know, Twitch, to being successful on Twitch is putting on a show and being entertaining and being engaging and, you know, having opportunities where people can feel like they're involved. And that that's so much more um, being present than than I ever anticipated. And even even when I was streaming before, it like the mentality of it kind of d- definitely switched in my head. And, and especially now that I'm streaming for longer periods of time. But yeah, I would just get done streaming at the end of the day, like go and sit down with my family, we'd eat dinner. And I there's been plenty of times where I like will literally fall asleep at the kitchen table. Oh wow! Um, because like I, you know, just my kids are just you know talking or being silly or finishing up the dinner because they eat slow, and I'll just be nodding, and sitting there. Or um, yeah, so um, that I wasn't expecting that, but I think that that just like any any new endeavor is something that you adapt to and become uh, become accustomed to. So, yeah, and so I think so do you? Yeah, do you? Um... Do you work offline or is all the work that you do on stream? That's a good question. So that that's another thing that I'm I'm trying to, to balance and that I haven't quite figured out yet. Um because mm-hmm. I because of the nature of streaming being, you know, it's it's a show. You're putting on a show, you're engaging with, with the chat. Um I think p- probably some of my more successful streams are probably not necessarily the ones that are, you know, me working on this really rad piece of art. They've been more about um, the engagement or, you know, some sort of involvement with the chat or that kind of thing. Um, you know, we, we occasionally run like these promotions to do these animorphs where I like morph people with animals. And in my, in my eyes, like those are just kind of like quick little fun doodles, not something that I would ever put in a portfolio, but, um, you know, those have been some of my most successful streams as far as, you know, um, revenue and that kind of thing. So, um, yeah, to answer your question. So I, I didn't anticipate how slow I would work on stream, um, even at, even having worked. But you know, when I first started streaming, I didn't have near as many people. You know, we had maybe like five people in the chat, so it was. I mean, it wasn't as like hectic. I could get more done. But even now, like 
I constantly joke on stream that I'm working at like one fifth the speed. So in the beginning, when I, you know, when I first made the transition, uh, as soon as my kids would go to bed and maybe I spent like an hour or so watching some shows with my wife, I'd jump right back on my PC and keep working for like the next four or five hours. And that would be where I would get like the bulk of my progress done because I just, art, I mean, you guys know, um, art is something that requires a lot of like thought and intent, you know, and, uh, What's what's the word I'm looking for? You, you just got to be very focused on mm-hmm. what you're doing. It's it's very active. You know, you um, you can't just kind of like passively sit back and uh, render something. I mean, they, yeah, there are there are points of the process where you know it's a little bit less uh, engaging. But yeah, so there there's a lot of the critical thinking, a lot of the big decision making. Some of it I feel like I've become somewhat blind to while I'm streaming because there's so much else going on that my brain that you know that analytical part of my brain that helps me to figure out and solve these problems just somehow it doesn't work right when I'm streaming. And, and again, that's, that's a, pro, that's a thing that I'm c- continuously developing. I'm getting faster and better at it. And it's a skill that, you know, hopefully, hopefully that the, you know, the amount of focus that I'll be able to give to my online stuff will catch up. But yeah, so there's plenty of, there's plenty of, I, I would say that like 80% of the stuff that I finish, I have to finish off stream just because there's, I, I just need that opportunity to be able to look at it objectively mm-hmm. And not have to be worried about if I'm being entertaining or not. Do you have a bigger problem starting a piece on stream or finishing a piece on stream? Um, honestly, both. Um, that that area in between where I'm just kind of like I, I have a direction and and I'm just executing it. That's probably the easiest part to stream. But I, I'm sure, as Joby knows, that there's a whole ton of prep work that goes into like preparing for a specific piece. And I would argue that if you're not doing that prep work as an artist, um, you're, you're, you're having a lot of missed opportunities. Um, but yeah, so that for me, for the way that I work and the way that, you know, and especially with my professional experience, um, very little making stuff up out of your head. I just, I mean, I know some artists can do that, but they do that because they have the experience of having, you know, studied it from life. Um, you know, I don't, the, the person that can just, you know, make things up out of their head without having studied it, that, that person doesn't exist. Um, so until you get to that point that you are very comfortable with a particular subject matter, um, and even, even when you are, I mean, you're still going to be better off, but yeah, so I spend a ton of time preparing. Um, so when I, when I get a commission, for example, a big, and I'll usually do this, so I don't stream until like 1 PM in in the afternoon. I'll usually spend like the bulk of the morning, you know, gathering reference, shooting reference of myself. I mean, I have a huge amount of reference of compromising photos of myself that I, (laughs) that I've taken. (laughs) Um, as I'm sure most artists do, but yeah, so um, kind of you know gathering Pinterest boards, and sometimes I'll do like thumbnail sketches, try to figure out what I'm doing. There have been definitely times when I've like tried to rough out something um, ahead of time, just so that I'm not like guessing. You know, I'm not having to like go through that process on stream. But I've slowly become more comfortable with like beginning something with you know blank canvassing something on stream. But yeah, there's definitely a ton of uh, prep work that goes into a lot of the pieces that I do. We were just talking a moment ago about stacking functions, you know, of any given piece of artwork that that you do, reselling it multiple times, basically. Maybe there's an OnlyFans account waiting for you and all of those (laughs) uh, compromising reference photos that you've taken of yourself. Um, If I felt like people wanted to see that, you bet bet that I would throw that up there. (laughs) Dude, you you might be surprised what people want to see on the internet. Um, Right. But let's come back to uh, freelancing for a, a little bit because I do want to talk more about uh, your streaming um, soon. But a few more questions in the uh, in that that transitional period um, between studio work and and freelancing. Um, how much did working at the studio help you in launching the freelance thing? Like in terms of like connections that you had made or. Um, you know, certainly there's an element of professionalism that I'm sure that you were prepared for by way of working in a studio. But, you know, what what kinds of things were sort of like really helpful for that experience? And do you think that people can jump into freelance kind of like straight away or is kind of working in a, you know, a studio environment something that you would recommend before doing that? What are your thoughts there? Yeah, I think, I mean, if, if the if the opportunity presents itself and someone has that option, I would take it. Just, I mean, even if it's not the most glamorous studio job, just to have the experience. Because um, there's a lot of stuff that most people just can't 
you know, it, it, they would have they, it, it's almost like reinventing the wheel or learn you know there's a lot of things that they would have to learn from scratch by themselves that i think that you could kind of fast track by being in a studio environment um so one of your questions was you know if i could have started sooner or if i could go back and like do anything different i mean even with even with everything that i've said and you know all of the reasons that i was anxious to try something new if i had to go back to do it over again i probably still would because of because of the things that i learned and uh yeah so um Sorry, the phone just rang and it kind of threw me off. Um, <laughs> okay, yeah. So I think having industry experience is huge. So I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of learning how to like handle yourself professionally, um, how to deal with clients. And so you know, as an individual trying to make your way into the corporate world, there's so many things that you don't know that you just you, you kind of learn as you go. There's a lot. There would be a lot of stumbling, a lot of um, and so being, you know, it being interjected into that environment, you know, you, you're part of, uh, you know, a company where with all the systems are already in place, you know, so you can kind of see how something functions um, the way that it should or, you know, ideally the way that it should. So, I mean, just just the opportunity of like seeing how uh, project managers talk with clients, you know, there, there'd be so many times where like you, you don't want to necessarily put like the artist on the phone or like in the new <laughs> meeting with the client because they don't know how to talk to people, you know, um, they don't know. I'm they, good they with people. To... <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, the, the ability to, to like understand, you know, how, how to hold, handle yourself professionally, how to talk, you know, the types of things you should say or not say, and you shouldn't say to clients, um, just being in that environment and just seeing how that all functions over the years. Yeah. We're not saying absolutely. Um, was huge for me. Um, and not that I, not that since I've made that transition, I've had to deal with any huge, you know, big name clients. I mean, that may be on the horizon, you know, that's the end goal. But um, mm -hmm. so far, most of my, most of my experience has been with the exception of um, one job has been with, you know, kind of smaller, but all the same, I think that that's valuable experience to have. Um, I think a, a big part of that to answer your question. So like, should you go the corporate or studio route first? I think a lot of that depends on ultimately on like what you want to do. Like where, where is it that you want to go with your artistic career? I mean, if, if you just want to, you know, keep your head down and do your thing and do something artistic and you're, you're okay with that. Like, you know, if, if the idea of just being like a cog in a big wheel sounds appealing to you, then, you know, I'll go for it. But um, I do think that there's a lot to be said of have that creative freedom, but again, it just depends it depends on so many things. It depends on your financial situation. It depends on your background. It depends on your current skill level. You know how much work you've invested, how much time you've invested. Um, you know, so there's some people, you know, that just pick up a Wacom tablet and they're like, "Do you think that I'm ready for commissions?" And you know, it's. Mm -hmm. um, I think, and to some degree, people, you know, there there has to be a, a period of you know time where you study and grow and get to a certain level professionally before you are prepared. Um, to embark on that journey on your own but a nice thing about the studio environment is you know you'll you'll often get people coming in at entry levels um maybe straight out of school or you know if they haven't taken school that are still kind of beginning and they can be kind of put into that op opportunity where they can learn and grow and um so yeah I, I i would say maybe not necessarily like my drawing and painting skills but there's so many things about um uh, like creating on the computer that I learned, you know, just, you know, things about Photoshop and all that, that I, you know, I, I never would have learned on my own. So I know that's not like a direct answer, but it, there it is. Oh no, I, it, it definitely is. Um, I'm, I'm wondering though about that specific part of the puzzle, you know, of, uh, <laughs> the professionalism, um, yeah. dealing with, with clients and yeah. talking to clients. And now that you're, on your own or you know when you when someone does make that transition that is a huge piece of the puzzle i and i think that if people are going to underestimate something it's probably that yep I, and and the and the list of 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 mistakes that you can make or you know or or uh, things to keep in mind for best practices is is way way too long but what do you think are like the top two or three like the thing, like some really standout things that you could tell somebody that's a little bit less experienced of like do's or don'ts, either one. Yeah. Yeah. So I know, I know a lot of people starting out and I've had this conversation with a few people in the community. Um, you know, they, they, they are, they feel very kind of unsure of themselves and 
with the way that they approach, you know, how they talk to potential clients, you know, it, that kind of shows. And one of the things that I think um, you just have to remember, and, and some of it is you put on that face, you put on that brave face, even though you're you're dying inside of like fear. You know, you you have to present yourself as a person that knows what they're doing, even if that even if you don't feel like and that and that takes work and that takes practice. But the reality of the situation is, for the most part. Um, people, you know, clients are coming to you because you're the expert and they have a problem that they need to solve. And they don't want, you know, they don't want to hear somebody that's kind of wishy-washy or or unsure of themselves. They want somebody that's like, okay, this is your problem. I know how to solve it. Um, So that's one, presenting yourself in a way that just having that confidence, even if you don't feel it. And that that confidence becomes, you know, it'll grow over time. But um, that's one thing I think that uh, a lot of people struggle with and then another thing is uh, kind of going on the same mentality. You know, the client is coming to you to solve problems. Sometimes, you know, sometimes they'll throw curveballs at you or they'll, they'll ask you to do things that um, maybe you don't agree with or, or you struggle with. But ultimately, the, the, your job as, as a professional is to help them get what they want. Um, and if, if you ever come, I mean, there's been plenty of times in, uh, with some of the clients that we deal with where you, know, you just, you, you have you very strongly, you have very strong convictions about, you know, this is the way that, something should go artistically to make the image look better and maybe the client has a different idea i mean it, it's not always necessarily to, to mean that you have to just do what the client says no matter what um you have to there, there have been plenty of times where i've been put in a situation where i'm doing something i'm asked to do something that i that i disagree with on an artistic you know design fundamental art principle level for you know for reasons that i could argue but uh, my boss you know or whoever is just like you just got to do it so that you have to figure out a way to, you know, you have to put it, it. Sorry, I'm having a hard time articulating this this concept, but you have to um, figure out a way to do your best and make, you know, put your best effort and somehow solve that problem in a way that you feel comfortable with, mm. um, while also um, meeting their their needs. So y- you can't you, know, you can't get to a point where you just kind of like wash your hands of it and say whatever they want this to be green, so it's green and and now it looks like garbage, you know. <laughs> um, so I, I I don't know I didn't I didn't probably articulate that point very well but um yeah no, I, so, I think you did okay yeah sometimes some clients would just say hey we want this all to be blue and purple and then you have to do the best that you can within that, those confines right yeah yeah so it's just yeah. one of those things yeah yeah and I think um I don't know I I think there's just some uh, general way of like how you talk to people. And I don't know exactly how you would teach that or, you know, I did take some like public communications classes in college, but just general yeah. ways of composing yourself around people being professional. Um, learning yeah. how to write an email. <laughs> yeah. Learning how to write an email, puncture, grammar, grammar. I mean, appropriate attire, you know, don't, don't come to zoom meetings in your pajamas um, kind of stuff. But yeah, so maybe, uh, don't point your ceiling know. fan or don't point your camera at the ceiling fan and uh, right. pretend you're not there. <laughs> I don't know if you saw this, but there was a post that went around Twitter recently. It was uh, somebody who was applying for a game uh, testing job. Mm. And uh, they were basically saying, hey, if you put me on the credits for all the pr- previous projects you work on, I'll work on your project for $3,000. It'll mm. only take me a week or two because I'm so good. And it was just the most condescending letter that I'd ever <sighs> seen. Like asking the person to get help them to get <laughs> more stuff on their resume and so they could apply it then to blizzard and riot which they thought for sure they were going to get those jobs so there's a lot of really bad habits out there that yeah. people just don't know they have yeah i think that i think that there's also just, just like a general sense of entitlement um mm-hmm. that i feel like is very very dangerous among you know because it I, to some, I mean, there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of the, the talk of, you know, you need to make sure I, I agree there, there's, there's two sides. It's a double-edged sword, you know, as a beginning artist, it's way too easy to get caught up in a trap of, you know, I'm doing art for that's like dirt cheap. And I, and I could be making more money going in, you know, working at McDonald's or at a fast food joint. I could be, you know, than than what I'm making as an artist. So there, there is the side of, you know, selling yourself too short um, and not, you know, asking for a fair price. I think that there's plenty of that going around, you know, artists um, feeling lack of self-confidence, don't feel like that their work justifies charging enough. I see, I see too much of that. And that, that's very sad. There's a flip side of that where feeling like, um, you know, you become emboldened by this, this kind of uh, 
mentality of, you know, well, I, I should be able to charge this amount because I'm an artist and I have all, you know, I have all these bills and all these things. But the reality comes down to like, you're, you know, you're providing a service that you're expected to be able to deliver something to a certain quality. And if you're not there yet, you're not there yet. Um, so I think as much time should be spent learning and growing and studying and getting yourself to a place um, where you, you know, you are marketable. Um, I think as much time, you know, so that, that might mean that during that period of time in your life, you, you do work at a, you know, at a job to help you kind of pay the bills while you continue to grow. But um, just coming straight out the gate and just be like, well, I, you know, because I'm an artist and because artists continuously get, you know, uh, taken advantage of, I feel like I should be able to make this much, even when your work doesn't necessarily reflect that. But yeah, I, I hadn't heard that tweet that you're mentioning. That's, that's very interesting. I'll see if I can pull it off and we can put it in the notes after the show. Yeah, that okay. would be that would be awesome. Um there's something that's a little bit more boring, um, but I would like to talk about it, you know, because sure. again, I think it's uh it's important for people to be able to digest um if they haven't been down this road before. You know, another thing that uh I think would probably trip people up is how different the bookkeeping is. You're now responsible for, you know, keeping track of how much money you make and all your taxes and all that kind of stuff. So what is can you just touch a little bit on what that looks like for you, like how that's changed and kind of how you've adapted to, you know, maintaining your own ledgers? Yeah, I mean, to some degree, I was already kind of doing that um, as an adult with, you know, family and kids. I'm, I'm mm-hmm. already assumed a, a big. So my bookkeeping hasn't actually changed a ton because um, I've already, you know. I already had bills to pay and all this stuff. So I, you know, that there, there, there wasn't too much that was new. It's just like the source of income and the amount of income and like the regularity of it. That's, that's the only difference. But I mean, what I do now and it, um, is I just keep like a, a big Excel document and I kind of record everything. And um, it, it requires me now to be a little bit more active in just double checking, you know, making sure that, you know, our, our, expenses don't necessarily exceed what's coming in and that and it um, I mean right now things are very unpredictable um there's some months where you know I've done really well and some months that are a little bit less so but um yeah I mean I, I don't know how to specifically answer your question uh other than I mean my, my dad I grew up with my grandparents kind of old school my dad very much drilled into me growing up like the key to financial uh security is don't spend money you don't have um mm-hmm. so I I feel like because of I've had you know that's that kind of uh, background and my dad's been very active in my life in making sure that I've made that I haven't made too many like unwise financial decisions that I don't have like a ton of debt um, and I think that I mean that that's getting more on the side of just like good financial um, practices and you know if you that that's where you want this <laughs> this to go but um, yeah so as far as bookkeeping goes um, I keep track of of everything I have an Excel document. Um, try to make sure that we're not spending more than what's coming in and just being being just being wise about that i mean it, it we're still we're still learning i'm not saying i'm doing it perfectly because I, I still have plenty of room to grow there the fluctuation of income is something that you have to contend yeah. with when you're when you're freelancing so what how is there are there some uh way of thinking about that or accounting for that you know in that idea of you know well don't spend more than you have but on any given month, you may not know what that number is going to be. So, how do you, you know, look down the? How do you how do you plan in advance when things can be so unpredictable? Yeah, I think in general, um, regardless of you know what you, what you do, I think that it's always wise to have some money saved up, like a nest egg. So it, it should you know you should you should always avoid or never get to the point that if if one month comes around and you're making like you know, if you make a certain amount less than what you were expecting, it should never get to a point that you're going to have to like foreclose or, you know, you're going to get your power shut off. Like that should never happen. Um, so if you don't have some sort of a fallback in place, then, you know, th- that should be your priority. So whether that's saving up um, a little bit each month, taking a percentage, um, whether you put money into investing, I mean, there's a lot, we could have an entire podcast about, you know, being wise with, with money. And I'm not the best person to give advice on that. Um, you know, I, I, I do have investments, you know, I, I deal with a financial advisor, so I'm not, I'm not making some of these decisions all by myself, but the basic principle is, you know, I always have some sort of a plan B. Um, and that's, that's kind of been what has helped me to 
sleep at night, you know, just knowing that if, if for whatever reason I don't make as much money as I anticipated that we're not going to, we're not going to go broke. Yeah. So many of these questions can be podcasts in and of themselves. Um, the, the thing though, that I think is important is to touch on them and yeah. highlight them as areas of significant importance. So anybody that is, you know, listening to this in the future, you know, they at least are equipped with the anticipation of these things. It's like, okay, well now I need to, I, now I have this list of things that I need to get better at in <laughs> financial planning, investing, saving, blah, 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 you know, all those kinds of things. And yeah, um, I mean, to, 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 I don't, I mean, to every, everybody's situation is unique. So I always feel very leery about giving like very specific, you know, advice sure. to people within um, a number of fields. Cause I mean, everybody's just, everybody's background is so different, but um, you know, coming out of school, um, I didn't have, I don't, I didn't have any student debt, um, you know, which is a big part of it. So, I mean, just trying to make just the, just the idea of just don't spending, you know, as much as you can, not spending money you don't have or setting things up in a way that, you know, avoiding debt as much as possible. You know, I, I know it's very, you know, uh, yeah, it's easy to want to go to the, to the Best Buy and pick up a big screen TV and, mm -hmm. you know, pay that off for the next however long, but it's like, I would much rather save up and just buy it. And then, you know, I'm not, I don't know. So there's the concept of just avoiding debt has been a huge um, factor in a lot of my decision-making as much as I can. So um, obviously, you know, we don't want you to go into, into specifics. Um, and you had right. mentioned before, you know, that you weren't close to matching the income that you had been making from studio work, but you had some, you know, projections on, you know, how, like, how that's going to start to match up. Uh, would you mind talking a little bit about that as far as, you know, like how, what you look forward to in the future is as far as bringing those two closer together? Yeah, I, I anticipate in the future and how long it takes me to get there is, is on me and how I can balance my time and make sure I'm actively trying to push things forward. Cause it's, it's very easy for, um, to just get kind of caught in a rut and not be making any progress. You know, it's very easy for me to just show up and stream and work on stuff and not be making active steps towards building these systems that we talked about. Um, so that is something that, that I'm struggling with, just making sure that I, you know, I, I'm, I'm contemplating um, taking like another, you know, because right now I stream four times a week. Um, and, and like that day off, I should be spending it like, you know, trying to figure out and build these systems. But um I sometimes end up just spending working on commissions and stuff. So I, I need to be more disciplined in that regard. But yeah, so I anticipate, um, and I couldn't give you a necessary time frame what that might look like, look like. But if, if I did everything that I was supposed to, which nobody does, um, <laughs> e I would say easily within like a year or two, I could be making the same, if not more than what I was doing. Because um, it's, I mean, if, if you, I mean, I'll just give you an example right now. Um, a friend of mine, the guy that works, um, that I work with, that I go to the gym with, the, the business guy. I mean, he he is a, he's a 3D artist, makes uh, is excellent at sculpting and b building things in 3D. And just with that, he he's opened up like a flower pot business and sells that on the side. And he's um, I mean, he's already making enough money that you know. Well, I don't want to I don't want to give his secrets away, but he's a uh, you know just just with that side of thing. I mean, there's there's enough interest, and he's he's played his cards right to the point that um, you know, he can't even keep up with the amount of the amount of orders that he's getting. So. Um, I, I remained, I know this isn't, I, I can't necessarily specifically answer your question because I don't know exactly what that looks like yet, but the confidence that I have remains steadfast that um, if you play your cards right and approach it, w you know, with a sound business sense that it's, it's, it's so possible to make money um, on the internet as an artist. You just, you know, you got to figure, you, basically there's, there's always going to be people out there that are going to be willing to pay. It's just, how do you get your work in front of those people? How do you, you know, that's, that's the rub, but yeah. So I don't have a specific timeline, but in every you know every week, every month, it's getting a little bit closer. So my, the responsibility is on me to just make sure that I am investing time in building the system so that we can I can get you know things to be a little bit more autonomous. Hey, thanks for listening. We continue this conversation in part two. You can get there immediately by clicking the thumbnail image on the bottom left of this video, and don't forget to hit subscribe. Have a great day.